Hello. Uh, my time up here is very short, so I'd like to start by wasting some of it. Very different view. <laughs> nah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so thank you. Now, some of you in the audience were probably during that little intermission there. You're probably thinking about stuff you have to do or about maybe the past two amazing talks by these geniuses who I have to follow. Uh, or maybe you're thinking about Game of Thrones or something like that. Uh, but maybe some of you, maybe, and this is probably fewer than most, just spaced out a little bit and got a little bored. And for those of you who did that, I say, well done, because that's what I'm going to talk about. And I think it's a skill we all need to develop and get a little better at. Uh, so this is, this is a family photo from 1979. <laughs> I'm the guy on the, on the far right there. And um, this, is, this is just a thing to do. We did this kind of stuff all the time. I'm just kidding. This is Halloween. And my mom, my mom, she sewed these costumes by hand for all, fall, uh, all four of us. And I asked her about this photo when I was looking at it recently. And I said, gosh, it must have taken a lot of time. And she said, yeah, but I had plenty of time to do it, despite the fact that she was running a preschool and had twin boys to raise, OK? Uh, these are my parents on a typical day, just hanging out the house. <laughs> um, no, of course, this is them at a party, one of the parties that they hosted. And they, they hosted a ton of parties. I remember this when I was really young. And their friends hosted a ton of parties, too. They all made time to do this stuff. Um, there were themes, and there were costumes, and it was, it was really a big to-do, right? Uh, and I was wondering, I was talking to my wife, I'm like, why don't we do this kind of stuff? Maybe my parents were just better at time management, or maybe they didn't have Netflix. <laughs> you know, according to a recent Nielsen study, um, the average American adult today spends 11 hours a day interacting with media, mostly screen time. So if you even just think about the fact that probably six to eight hours of that is, is work-related, you're still putting in, you're building in three to five hours a day of screen time. So think in a week, just a week, how many of those hours we could spend planning a kick-ass Game of Thrones party. I like Game of Thrones, OK? Sir, settle down. <laughs> so I asked my parents, why did you have so many parties? And they simply said, because there really wasn't that much else to do. It was 1979, 80s. It was the early 80s, right? And so you, most middle class Americans got home around 5, 5.30. There were three TV channels to watch, right? No email, no calls, no Slack. Slack's great, but come on. Slacking all day long. Uh, you know, you read the latest Stephen King book, and you'd already seen Jaws in the theater, OK? There's always the bedroom, right? But not everybody's into the tantric thing, so <laughs> Sting can give that a rest. I'm tired of hearing about it. Uh, so you threw a party because you got well and truly bored, right? And so think about it. Boredom is actually a blessing, right? It gives your brain time to just cook stuff up, to wander and to cook. So what does this mean for all of us in this room? We're creative folks, right? What does it mean for creative work? Well, look at my parents. Okay, I mean, we're looking at them a lot. Sorry, it's, this slide's up here a long time. But look at them. They got creative because that's what humans do when they have the time and the space to do it, right? So here's a fact. The more important work that pushed my career forward, the majority of it, for me, happened in the, t in the time I spent in between uh, meetings and calls and um, reports and deadlines and things like that. I know all those words mean something and it's real work and it's important, right? But uh, these kinds of things don't often directly lead me to the bigger ideas. Yeah, this is definitely not going to be on my tombstone. But I will say it's, it's true, though. I do meet my deadlines, if anybody wants to work with me on something. 
Um, because those kinds of things, right, the meetings and so on, they, they force our brains to work in a different mode. We're working on organization rather than improvisation, okay? So my best creative ideas are born when I have time and space uh, between the busy work to just kind of let my medial prefr uh, prefrontal cortex wake up. And Dr. Ming's going to check me on my, my wording there. Um, but anyway, this is a part of the brain that is more active, okay, when you are pleasantly distracted, quietly distracted, not doing this, okay, when you're relaxed or otherwise doing some kind of like, you know, activity that isn't managing a task. And in a published scientific study entitled Neural Correlates of Lyrical Improvisation, uh, they studied, uh, scientists discovered that this part of the brain also fired up when rappers had to do fr uh, freestyle rapping versus doing over-rehearsed uh, raps that they've done a million times. And you know that feeling when you stare off into the distance when maybe somebody's fixing your car and there's the noises all in the background, like the hoses and the lifts and everything, and it kind of blurs into this white noise, and you sort of get into this fog, and suddenly you're like, oh, 20 minutes went by, right? Pay attention to that feeling, because a part of your brain there is waking up that usually isn't that active. So maybe downtime doesn't mean what we have to think it means, at least in creative terms, because with downtime, your imaginations wake up, right? We're not bogged down with busy work, so other stuff bubbles up to the surface. If you want to take full advantage of the creative potential of downtime, you have to allow yourself the space and the time to get bored. But the problem is that boredom is something that is disappearing from our lives, okay? Day by day by day. And when boredom first sets in, you might feel restless or kind of unproductive and you run through the list in your head like you might have been doing earlier today. Work stuff, groceries, kid stuff, mistakes you made, who to frame for those mistakes. Um, but if you're just patient and you move past that phase and settle in, then your brain switches gears. And it starts to wander and tell stories and paint pictures. And suddenly, you might have an idea. I'm not making this up. Science has shown that our subconscious can be busy solving problems in the background while we sleep. Okay, you probably all read that somewhere. Um, the great comedian John Cleese gave a talk about this at Cannes uh, not too long ago. And it was about creativity, and he recalled a time he realized that his subconscious mind was busy improving a comedy sketch he had written earlier and had set aside. And when he came back to it, suddenly he was writing it better. And in his talk, he said, we can't control our unconscious, but we can look to how we can create the circumstance in which it becomes easier for us to work with our unconscious. So what does that mean for us? Well, for one thing, if you want to have more creative ideas, you need to put yourselves in situations where you can well and truly space out. Uh, we need to give our brains time and space to play, essentially. I mentioned relaxation because it makes it easier for our brains to release dopamine, I'm sure you've heard of dopamine before, uh, which has been shown to increase creativity in tests conducted on subjects at the Medical University of Vienna. So kids have this advantage. They immediately can access this state of mind unless you plop them in front of an iPad. And my wife and I are really strict about screen time. Um, some friends of ours ac actually call us the screen Nazis. I know Nazi is a terrible word to say. I just mean that's what they call us. So, I'm just being honest. Um, and like any parents, we're mostly just winging it. So this could be a terrible thing. Maybe we're not preparing them for the world, but we just don't let them have any screen time. And this is them. They can make a game or a story out of literally anything for hours. And it looks like they're just sitting here, but what they're actually doing is playing a game called Grandma. And <laughs> they have canes, which are the badminton rackets. And they have uh, uh, recliners, which are these deck chairs. And they move the chairs all around the backyard and the patio, and they make funny voices, and they have a cast of even supporting characters. Like there are the shuckers, which live in all the bushes, and they'll pinch your fingers if you get too close. And they have the nennies, which are these tree creatures that only eat cheddar cheese. I'm not, make, I'm not making this up. And a while ago, I was on a walk uh, out in the woods, and my daughter, she found this small dried up vine. And she put it on her finger, and she said to me, I'm Dr. Wizfizz, the pinky scientist. 
And I work at the Fingerling Institute, and I'm going to teach you all about animal languages. And I'm like, oh, what? That just came out of nowhere. And then we got home after the walk, and she sat down at the kitchen table and immediately started drawing this character, Dr. Wizfiz, that she had created during this walk. So she went from a vine to a character with a backstory and a whole world,、uh, you know, without skipping a beat. Now, if we had come home and plopped her down in front of a TV show or an iPad or whatever, do you think that would have happened? I think it's unlikely.、Um, so, what if we train ourselves to see what we perceive to be boredom as a blank canvas for our minds? There's tons of potential there. Maybe then we'll have more of our own Dr. Wiz Fizz kind of moments. But most of us avoid boredom and even what I call pre-boredom, like the plague. If we have to wait one minute, and I, you know this is true, one minute for a coffee at a Starbucks. Out come the phones, right? We're so bad at being bored. One of my favorite artists, Roman Muradov,、uh, recently wrote this excellent book related to all this, and it's called "On Doing Nothing: Finding Inspiration in Idleness." And I recommend everybody here pick it up and read it. It's a really short read, and it's very enlightening. All right, so I want to prove that、um, this talk isn't all just hype.、Uh, let me share some personal stories.、Uh, these are three things, three boring things. Uh, that have led to some of my, my best ideas and have really pushed my career forward. Believe it or not. So my toothbrush, beet juice, and goldfish snacks. I'll start with my toothbrush.、Uh, just so you know, brushing your teeth ranks just way up there with taking a shower for generating great ideas and for spacing out and for just having some me time.、Uh, anyway, on a regular morning in late 2009, I was brushing my teeth and I had my eyes closed. So when you close your eyes, things get dark. And as I was brushing my teeth, and I heard that swish, scratch kind of sound of the, the toothbrush on my teeth, I was picturing little lines of white toothpaste just kind of floating around. And then eventually, they started making simple patterns, you know, diagonal here, vertical here, and so on. And I just stopped and realized I had created an iPhone game. Okay, this is weird, but that's what I imagined, and I called it White Lines. And it's ironic that I am talking about wasting time with our devices while also celebrating and bragging about the invention of my time-wasting iPhone game. I realize this, <laughs> but but as a creative as a creative exercise, this was really really exciting for me because one, I didn't own an iPhone. I'd never played an iPhone game before, so I actually had to run out to Best Buy and get a, an iPod because they're cheaper, so I could test what I was building. And、um, in the game, white lines appear quickly on the screen in a certain pattern, and then you have to echo it back with your fingers. So it's like that '80s game Simon, but in a different form.、Uh, here's an old video of me testing the game before submitting it to Apple. I apologize for the low resolution. See how it works here. Very simple, not that complicated. Um, I used Photoshop to make the graphics, and then I found a developer on Twitter just by searching for iPhone developer, and、uh, I literally did that.、Uh, he lives in、um, in Ireland. His name is Dennis Hennessy, and so what we did is we just collaborated over Skype, and in about three weeks we had a finished game, and we submitted it to Apple. And I thought that was a really cool exercise. But White Lines became a top 50 iPhone game at the time, and sold、uh, over 20,000 units in two months. And it was featured on the App Store homepage for three weeks, so very exciting.、Uh, a surprising twist too was that professors at Wake Forest University actually wanted to use the game in a fun experiment that measured people's ability to recall visual patterns and potentially even improve short-term memory. So, I'm a scientist too. <laughs>、uh, so thank you, dental hygiene.、Uh, but most importantly, thank you to my brain for just for a moment spacing out. That was the main ingredient. In 2016, I was sitting around having some lunch, and I had just finished. And I looked at my plate, and there was beet juice on my plate that had mixed with olive oil, and it made this really beautiful pattern. And so I just kind of stared at it and spaced out. I'm very good at spacing out.、Uh, and this was at a time when my Photoshop brush business—there's such a thing, by the way—it was called KyleBrush.com. It was doing really, really well, but I had run out of ideas. I had nothing left. And I needed to keep making stuff, but I just felt like I've got nothing. And、um, the beets and the oil are what saved me, because I had spent so long trying to emulate natural media, oils and watercolors and charcoal and whatever, that I hadn't fully explored or even really thought about the potential for making brushes that do special effects 
like things you can't do in the natural world when you're painting and drawing. Uh, so I took a photo of this beet juice pattern. This is the actual photo that I took, and then I, I softened the edges in Photoshop. And I sent it to myself via email, and I wanted to try, try and create some kind of brush out of it. And it became later the oil and vinegar brush. And this was the first brush I made out of about 150 that became later my concept brush art set. And here's a look at the brush in action. And artists use it for textures, starscape backgrounds, and bubbly patterns, and all kinds of things. All right, so the concept brush set far exceeded my expectations. And uh, it sold over 9,000 units in the first month and earned over $100,000 in, in sales. So yes, you can make money making Photoshop brushes. Uh, but that was, that was an absolute mind-blowing experience for me. And it all happened because I was staring at some beats on a plate. Um, it also led me to then be able to really explore a whole range of brushes that were no longer tied to this natural media emulation thing, which had been my sort of shtick for a long time. So thank you, Beet Juice. And thanks again to my brain for spacing out. All right, so goldfish snacks. So when you have uh, young children, you sit at a picnic table. Uh, some of you are going to be familiar with this. You sit at a picnic table with other parents who you mostly don't want to talk to uh, while your kids are playing in the playground. And you're watching your kids, and you're admiring them while you're judging the other parents' kids. Right? <laughs> you know it's true. Sir, you know it's true. You don't... Settle down. Uh, so anyway, at such a playground one time, I was sitting there, and I was just kind of, you know, it's not that fun. Let's all be You're just kind of sitting there, and you don't really want to be there. But I was having a nice kind of a spacey moment. And then suddenly was interrupted behind me. This, this voice shouted out, I want a fish. I want a fish. And I turned to look, and I saw a mom hand one of these goldfish snacks uh, to this little girl. No words were exchanged. She just handed it to her. She gobbled it up, and then she ran back to the swings. Now, I didn't like this. Okay? I was appalled by this interaction. <laughs> because I'm a lifelong fan of manners. And please, is one syllable word. You could teach it to a one and a half year old, okay? My kids are running around saying, ball peas, this peas, anything peas, close enough, okay? And adults need to learn it too, okay? I cannot stand being in a coffee shop, standing in line, and somebody's in front of me, and I hear them say, yeah, I'm going to do the, or yeah, I'm going to get the, or yeah, let me, let, let, talk to people with some respect, say please, okay? It's not a big thing to ask, all right? I just want to ask everybody to do this. Um, so anyway. I was going to bed that night, and it was just in my head, I want to fish, I want to fish. <laughs> it's driving me nuts. And uh, it, you know how when you wake up in the morning, you're in that, that really just fantastic half asleep, half awake thing? The only way to get there, by the way, is do not do the whole alarm and then snooze, snooze, snooze thing. It just kills it all. Um, because all you're doing then is anticipating the snooze. So don't do that. But if you, just, if you just wake up and then just sit there and you're kind of like sort of starting to fall back asleep, this is a good moment to be in this, this special state of mind. So I'm there and I hear, I want to fish, I want to fish. It comes bubbling up to the surface again. And in my mind I say, please say please and I'll grant your wish. And I just had done a little kind of call and response, right? And then suddenly I jumped up and I started writing little rhymes, okay? And then I took those rhymes, and I went to my, uh, my Wacom tablet, and I started drawing. And within about a week, I had my first um, book dummy for a, a children's book idea. So Please Say Please was sold to Scholastic in 2015 in a two-book deal <laughs> with, thank you, uh, with my, my agent, uh, Lori Abkemeyer. So if you're all looking for a picture book agent, she's great. And the book was published in 2016. And um, this was my proudest achievement um, of, my, of my professional life. And the reason is because uh, this book has given me the opportunity to visit Title I schools in uh, North Carolina, all over the state, and give the gift of reading and storytelling to hundreds of kids who sometimes don't have uh, a single book at home, much less even, even a pencil. Or the, the kids I've met, I mean, it's really it, it opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, and thanks to my partnership with uh, Bookmarks, which is a nonprofit uh, literacy organization, uh, the book was also donated uh, to all the local libraries in the area, but also to uh, 500, thanks to a grant we got 
uh, 500 low-income first grade students were um, given a signed copy of the book to take home. And they were also, um, I went to visit these schools and we, we gave them this idea that they too could become authors someday. And it was, it was so cool at the end to see when I would do a reading, so many kids uh, say to me, I want to be an author. You know, and this is something that hadn't even been, hadn't crossed their minds. So it was, this has been the best experience uh, so far of my professional life. Um, so thank you, Goldfish. Uh, thank you, Annoying Toddler. And um, <laughs> thank you for the third time to my brain for just completely spacing out and, and making something happen. So these meaningful projects moved me forward in my career and were born out of moments of spacey boredom, right? Um, so I think that uh, original ideas live inside us all, but they swim in deeper waters. And most of us spend most of the time just skimming the surface. And that's the problem, because our world looks like this to us all the time. Uh, so there's an expression about knowing something like the back of your hand. So I want to try something. Um, how many of you have actually ever even bothered to look at the back of your hand, honestly? Uh, so just if we could, oh, good for you. <laughs> that's intense. All right. so. I'd like us all to try something. I just want you to turn your attention to the back of your hand. OK? Just look at that. Don't look at anything else. And um, just study it for a second. Now, if you're a writer, imagine describing it as a landscape. OK, you have some terrain there, and it's comprised of peaks and valleys. And the lines in the skin are branching off from one another like so many dried up rivulets. OK, what else do you see? Just, just think about it. And just, just let it take all of your attention. Get lost in all the details. Maybe you're a painter or a visual artist of some kind. So you can trace all the contours with your eyes and connect the landmarks. Organize what you see by value, shape, proportion, color, and temperature. Do it as slowly as you can. And then strive to do it even more slowly than that. You haven't even gotten to the fingernails. They're different from your neighbors. There's a faint blue gray, uh, green, excuse me, in the veins for some folks that's kind of peeking through here and there, appearing and disappearing. And now if you move just one finger, the whole thing changes. And when you think you've seen all of it, now you're really ready to move on to the next thing, which I'm sure many of you are, that's exactly the time when you actually need to rest with it much longer. Okay, because this is now where you're getting to that moment that you might call boredom. But it's really only the beginning, I believe, of deeper observation and true creative exploration. This is where a new idea could be lying in wait for those who are open to discovering it. And it's the space between. This is that beautiful, blank, unexplored space we will probably lose altogether if we're not careful. We need to seek it out. We need to bask in it now and then, because I think it's a very important place to be. So thank you for your time, and enjoy the rest of this wonderful conference. <laughs>